So think of a, a great product like iPhone, a Tesla car, Microsoft Office. Well, some of you guys might disagree with me, but it's a successful product. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any of these. What do they have in common? They all address the needs of their customers or their users. Now, think of some great people. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, typical rivalry. George Washington, Martin Luther King Jr., or someone who you just respect a lot. You can think of one yourself. And what do they have in common? They address the needs of the people around them. And the successful ones address them scalably. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic. It's called need finding. Very literally, it basically means finding the need. So it's a concept within design thinking. So you need find so that you understand the need, and then you can develop the best product for it. Because you understand the need, you're fulfilling the need. Need finding, just like design thinking, to me, it's not just a way to improve the products that you make. It's not just a way to create a startup that will live. But in fact, it's a lifestyle. It's something that I do every day, everywhere. I do it when I'm with my parents, when I'm with my friends, when I'm with my girlfriend, when I'm at work, not at work, when I'm working on a product, of course I need fine. The thing is, you don't just cater for someone else's need when you are designing a product. I believe we should always be sensitive to others' need. So need finding, right? Let's start with need. When we're looking at need, we're basically looking at three things. First one, it's pain relief or problem solver. Say you have a problem statement, you try to solve that problem or something that you need to achieve a certain goal. For example, a screwdriver, a wrench. Those are very functional tools that helps you get somewhere. Desire is the next thing. It can be understood as things that you want but don't need. And a product recently released, I think, did really well. Well, Apple does really well at this. Basically, a friend of mine told me that he was at an Apple store five times trying to convince himself that he actually needs an iWatch. Now, that's, that's, <laughs> that's kind of interesting to me. Now, whether you actually think it's useful, that's up to you. But what Apple did really well there is that they have created a desire that basically, I would say, kill logic, right? It basically overwhelms that person. And the next one is barrier. I'll explain to you why I put it here also along with the other needs. Basically, barrier is something that stops other people or your customers from achieving the desire or pain relief through your product. And the reason why it's here is because barrier is basically the need for rest. It could be a need for rest emotionally, right? A barrier to reach a person is that person don't want to be spending emotional effort. A barrier it could also be a rest physically. You place, a store, you place your product in a store that's so far away, or you make your product so hard to use, then in that case, it's a need for a rest mentally that is not being met. So that, these are all different aspects of needs that you guys might want to look into when you are creating your own product, when you're creating your startup. In fact, let's just take startup for an example. Pain relief. That is a problem statement in page two of your deck, most likely. It's basically where you state, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm creating this product, so this problem gets solved. So that's your pain relief. But that gives you a product to a problem, and that's a funnel that most likely will convert you no customers. That's why, oh, sorry. That's why you need to look into desire. Desire is basically what makes your funnel more practical, and it actually helps your startup live and compete. So what you need there is basically a good UX, right? An understandable product, a clear value proposition, good marketing and branding. So all those execution helps to create a desire. And barrier that you need to remove, bad UX. Super complicated product that only you understand. Bad positioning and channels. No one can find your product. Then regardless of how good a solution you have, no one is going to use it. All right, now we have a look at needs from a couple aspects. Let's look at the finding part. Now, finding 
it's because it's almost never there for you to grab. Now, I'm not talking about the need that people tell you. It's not about very clearly saying, I want something. I'm saying the real need underneath it. When you understand that, you can create a product that really caters to it. And the reason why it's never there with your customer that you can just ask them and they would just give you is because of two things, and especially for products. For products, let's say if you're designing a new product, you're innovating, right? By definition, you're creating something new that's not there yet. Before iPhone, do you think anyone, well, apart from Steve Jobs himself or his team, do you think anyone else could tell you that they wanted an iPhone? Before cars, Henry Ford, right, there's a very, very famous quote. If he asked his customers what they would want, they would say, faster horses. But do you want to create or train faster horses, or do you want to create a car? So that's one. The users themselves don't have the vocabularies to describe what they need. Two, if you're creating a product that has already reference cases in the market, right? So let's say if you're brave enough to create an iPhone comp competition. So you go out and do need finding, and then you go ask your customers why, ask your, um, I guess, competitor's customers why they want an iPhone. What you'll get is never the real need. You'll get a lot of justifications. Here's why. Most decisions, actually according to so many researchers online, you can look it up on Google, it will come out like 10 or 20 results. So many different people pay so many millions to find that, but it's kind of common sense. Basically, emotions are what make your decisions. Your logic comes after. For most of the decisions, that's the case. You have already started making a decision, and then you need to justify it. And for purchasing, this is more obvious. When you buy an iPhone, you know you want it first before you have the reasons. And then guess what? Because you paid that money for it, because you've decided to go for it, you're already in that journey, then you justify it. Why I buy an iPhone, it has a big screen. Hell, a lot of other phones have big screens, right? Okay, it has multitasking like, capabilities. There are so many things with multitasking capabilities out there. Oh, it has a full package. It's a very nice design. Come on, I mean, there are so many other brands that have nice design. They have a good ecosystem. You will start to come up with more and more reasons until you think that it's enough. So that's why you will never really find the real need but justifications. And for a person, it's even harder. We don't really understand the real need underneath us. And I think sometimes um, it's actually kind of interesting because I run, I run my own startup, and my startup is called Ionic. We built custom watches. So what's the problem I'm solving? I actually don't know, to be honest. Well, there, if there are investors here, so don't, don't hit me on that. But uh, to be really honest, I don't know. I know on the stats, right, 25% of e-commerce shoppers want customized products. But is that really the problem I'm solving? So our team went out to do need finding again. We find our customers, we interviewed them, we asked them how they feel about our product in an effort of having a refreshed view in uh, what problem we're actually solving. So this is the video that we got. I'm quite proud of my watch, actually. Yeah. I absolutely love it. I love it. And it was a really incredible five-year anniversary gift. Billions of people in the world, but there's only one of this, and it's on my wrist. And no one else has this watch. <laughs> my perception of what like a watch is to someone changed. It wasn't just like, oh, I have a watch that tells the time, right? It's like a watch that, that in the period that I designed it, meant something to me. You know, every time I wear the watch and every time I look down at it, it just reminds me how much Jeff knows me and how much he cares about the little things that I care about. <laughs> You can't put a price on that, like that emotional connection is that whole concept of like love is everlasting, right? For me to kind of have that feeling, that sense when I look at the watch, I think something I wouldn't just get in a watch if I went and bought it off a shelf. So, so well, that's not part of the talk, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> see, there is that love there. There is a timeless aspect to it. There is uniqueness. 
there are there are like they, they want nice designs. They they feel connected. They're reminded of a certain story or a certain period. There's so many things in there, it's so complicated. But then we are addressing all those needs, right? But how do we do that effectively? And on the between people interactions with our friends, with our families, right? What if we can understand others' need beyond what is explicitly communicated? Imagine a, a day when, actually imagine a world, if we actually start training children from young to see beyond what is explicitly stated by their parents, to see the desires, to see actually what, to see the heart behind what they say. And in a world when you work, right, what if you can see beyond those assignments that your boss gave you? You see their pressure, you see why they are driving so hard. You see the pressure that they get themselves and the stakeholders that they need to deal with. You understand that pain. Can you do better at your job? I bet so. Boyfriend and girlfriends, right? Imagine a world when guys don't need to hear from their girlfriend before they know what their girlfriend wants. That'd be amazing. And my girlfriend's right here smiling. So I probably am getting on something right there. But anyhow, so let's get started. We've looked at need, we've looked at the reason why we need to find it. How we find it? One way to do it is actually dig deeper. So need finding, beyond what's explicitly stated, we can ask two questions. One is why, which look deep work, kind of downward. And then you can ask why you want an iPhone that question that I showed you earlier. And then people will say like bigger, bigger screens, right? And then you ask why bigger screens? They will tell you what they use it for. Keep going, keep digging, don't stop. And then what ifs? That looks for implications. So they talk about bigger screens. Let's say they say they want bigger screens to look at better photos, nice photos, better view, right? What if the screen was twice as big? What would happen then? What if the screen is smaller, but then there is a capability of projecting that image somewhere else so that you can see it clearer? Would that be interesting? So you ask questions that way. You explore both ways, up and down. Next thing, the ecosystem. You ask about everything around it. Where you bring it to, what you use it with, why you like about it, what are the accessories that you use with it, how you charge it. Ecosystem, everything around it, first to second order. And discount it with the subconscious and emotional impacts that you have on those feedbacks. First, we'll go with subconscious. The way I dress today, how I walk up here just now, actually from here, how I started talking, already determined half the impact of my speech today. The TED branding primed you about the quality of the talk today. And then the fact that you actually persuaded yourself to get here and stay through the talk and actually be still awake at this point of time listening to me, that effort already told you and persuaded your mind that this is an attractive talk because or else you wouldn't be awake. Now with all those subconscious impact, right? Actually, now that I think about it, why did I work so hard on this talk now? I can kind of just stand up here and then you guys will think it's great. But anyhow, let's, let's get back to this. So on the emotional side of it, which is the other side of it. These are the things that are soft, that people can't explain to you, but it actually affects your decision a whole lot. And on the emotional side of it, it's something that you can't even explain. Exactly the Apple example that I told you. And the only way to do that is to empathize, to understand that it's to empathize. According to Google, there's a new source of definitions. It's understand and share the feelings of another. The first keyword is understand, which is the homework that I told you a bit earlier. You look deeper, you look for implications, you look for this ecosystem around it, you understand everything that's factual. I have had the privilege to actually interview someone who did a very, very good need finding exercise. So around two years ago, actually no, more than that, three or four years ago, so there was a gaming company that wanted to release a racing game. And that game, they wanted to introduce some drift, actually downhill, I think mountain drift racing, that's what they call it. So they, they hired an agency to go out and do need finding. And I got the privilege to actually sit with the guy who was sent to do the job. He told me he started with a pen, a notebook, and a video camera. 
So he wanted to do a typical neat finding interview where you sit down and ask all the questions trying to understand a person. A month and a half later, he came back, getting a job done. At that point, he was already a street racer himself. He knows how to drift downhill. And he has made relationships. And he told me those are going to be lifelong friendships. So that tells us a bit about the sharing part of empathize. To really understand need beyond the logical aspect, you need to know the emotional aspect of it. And to really understand and share the feelings of another, you need to invest in a relationship. You cannot just go there and use your mind to do it. You need to invest your emotions. You need to care. A person next to you is sad. You can comprehend that. But it doesn't tell you much more about that. If you care about that person, and if you have done the homework of understanding the depth of their need, the implications of what they want, and the ecosystem, what drives them, what are the things around them. If you understand that, it will give you enough ground to put yourself in their shoe and think, OK, this person is sad, and this is the situation she is in. At this point of time, she would probably want this. And that guess, right, that you can probably can't even explain right there is the holy grail of need finding. So when you develop a product, go out and reach out to other customers. Care about them, really. Know them and remember that you're trying to serve them. So a couple tips to conclude. First, never assume that anyone is just like you. So this, this sounds really stupid. I think a lot of you guys think that this is huge common sense, but everyone does it, I'll just tell you that. I did it. I developed an app to help people design watches, right? I told you a bit earlier. And then I would take that app to people and then abhor at the stupidity of them because they don't even know how to get to step two and there's like three steps. There's like a huge button right there on the iPad that you can tap and they wouldn't tap it. So, <laughs> and then what, what did I do next? Uh, when I wasn't really aware that I was, what I was supposed to do, what I did was, okay, so this is how you do it. I would show them that. And then I started flying with it, I dancing with it, I went to the moon with it, I can did all crazy things with my app, obviously, right? The app, I designed it with my team. I know everything I could do with it. After that, I get a great thank you. Your app is great. The guy stopped using it. Of course, he doesn't know how to use it. He saw how I used it, and he probably felt a bit insulted subconsciously because he didn't know how to use it, and I showed that it was so easy, and that's not helping me. Next thing, spotlight on others. Be selfless and listen, and this is extremely important for startups too. Startups, um, product developers, our product, our idea is like our pet, or even our kid, or our girlfriends. It's kind of scary. Um, we care about it so much. We bring it to people, we show it to people, and then we ask for feedback, and guess what happens, right? They take 10 seconds to comprehend what it is, which is already very good. And within that 10 seconds, you already feel that it's too long. It's like five seconds, oh shit, he's like, he still don't know what this is, and then it's like, Ugh, what's going on? And then at 5.5 seconds, you start explaining the whole story, the history, your passion, the product, from step one to step three, and all the bonus and all the features that you have developed and that no one would know. And then after 15 minutes, you ask this one question. So how do you like this product? The one answer is, it's awesome, it's great. You know why that's the answer? If a stranger walk up to you and tell you in 15 minutes their life's accomplishment, you probably would have said that it's great. You probably would have said that it's impressive because you don't want them to feel bad. A need finding exercise can fail, right? In this way, you're not getting anything. You end up doing a sales pitch. Lastly, I know I'm repeating this, empathize. At the end of the day, it's an art. Need finding is an art. You can never really understand everyone. So the only way to do it right is to improve it. You just can't really do it right, so you just always improve it. And then the only way to practice and get better at it is to empathize. Next time you see a person next to you, think about their need first before yours. You see someone in pain, understand their pain before you think about your discomfort in getting out of your safety zone to help that person. I don't know if there's any other way to put it, but really, Love your neighbors as yourself. Care about your customers. Remember you're developing something for someone, or you're being someone for someone you care about. So that's all I have today. Thank you.